Adam sorts through the array of newspapers fanned out across the long counters if he's choosing the right cut of meat. Behind the counter, lottery tickets are on display, the true meat and drink of the small store. There is a coffee service, a double burner stainless steel maker offering one glass pot of regular and another of decaf. The regular is fresh, there is profit in being an early riser, and Adam helps himself to a large cup. He picks up a package of peanut butter crackers, which have become his breakfast of choice. Four seventy-five. The proprietor shifts his cigar to the other side of his mouth. Adam digs out three crumpled bills and makes up the rest in coins. Coins he should have saved for his laundry. He's got to make an ATM stop sometime today. See if he can get by on a hundred till next week. Maybe he better do it before the sentencing. The sentencing... A wave of dismay percolates through him. The hand holding the coin trembles slightly, as if Adam is standing on the platform as a train blasts through. Will the judge send him to jail? It wasn't an outright assault, despite what Sophie kept slipping into the testimony. It was a slap. She wasn't really traumatized. That whole bit about counseling and fear of men is hogwash. He isn't a danger to anyone. He hasn't made it impossible for her to work. Her leave of absence from Dynamic is a sham. The accusations and effect of his, albeit stupid, action had risen in graduated levels of absurdity as the trial went on. Adam takes in a breath, letting the pain of breathing distract him from his line of thinking. Lately, he has experienced pain like that from cracked ribs, as if he'd been the one attacked. Do you have anything stronger than aspirin? The proprietor gestures toward a small display of patent medicines and shrugs. Tylenol, Advil, the usual stuff. My wife likes a leave. Adam studies the boxes, reads the ingredients, thinks back on the various commercial claims each one professes, and then checks the price. You take credit cards? Tens all a limit. Adam gathers one of each brand into his arms and dumps them on the counter with his paper and the coffee. Thanks, pal. The proprietor bags his stuff and hands the plastic bag to him. Outside, Adam shoves his papers under his arm, shifts the plastic bag of drugs. Glancing next door, he sees the tropical fish store woman unlocking her door. She's dressed in low-rise jeans and a tank top that just about touches the waistband. Her hair is still damp from her shower or from the early heat and it hangs in gentle waves to her shoulders and is the color of molasses. She nods to him, a fellow early bird. Adam has seen her before, just not this close. He spends a great deal of his day watching the street from his bolt hole of an apartment. He's watched her perform what seems to be a daily ritual of washing her front window, a willowy undulation side to side, up and down, as she squeegees the plate glass with her long pulled blade. What can he say to her? He feels a little like a voyeur face to face with his object. Up close, she's older than he thought. Not a girl, despite her youthful clothes. But a woman maybe in her late thirties, early forties. Adam hesitates too long and she disappears into the shop. Taking a sip of his coffee, Adam waits to take advantage of a lull in the increased morning traffic. A moment later, the woman reappears her hair bundled back out of the way with an elastic, a bucket of water in hand. Morning. There, he's established that he's a human being. She gives him the wary look of a woman alone on a city sidewalk, and he becomes conscious of his scrappy attire. Morning. Nothing more. She turns to her window washing. Hot again. Points for having a conversation. Points off for being platitudinal. Sure is. Her accent is tipped with some flavor not from here. Southern? Midwestern? Keep cool. You too? Sure. A hot courtroom, his destination. An unknown penalty. A life off the rails. He's cool. Absolutely. They spotted the dead dog first. The rest of us, mom, dad, and two others, were shocked into a momentary silence before coming to our senses and barking invectives at the men.
and the woman. She's the one who knelt over the body of my late challenger, running her hand gently down his side as if he might enjoy the feeling. I stopped my noise to watch. Two uniformed men and one woman stood in our cellar and swore grandly at what they had come to see. It was a little stagey, their response, as if they were pleased to have been proven correct, that they had chosen well. I yarked. Mom and Dad shrank to the back of their cages. One of the others actually growled, catching the attention of the men, who stopped swearing and grimaced with some decision. I yarked some more, a little uncertain and more than curious. What did this visit really mean? The men carried poles with loops of lines sticking out of their hollow cores. The woman seemed more confident and unlatched the cage containing my mother and my siblings. Mom shrank back but was silent, which the woman took for a good thing. Come on, Mommy, I won't hurt you. I stopped my yarking, wanting to hear more of this voice. Fiddy, my dad, sat down and did something that was extraordinary in my mind, something I had never seen him do, but I understood immediately the reason for it. He put one paw up against the mesh of his cage front, an imploring, hey, I'm with you, sort of gesture. The men visibly relaxed. The woman tentatively held out a hand to mom. Mom wasn't having any of it and pressed herself even deeper into the cage. In her experience, someone wanting her out of her cage meant only two things, a fight or a fuck. The woman snapped her fingers softly and made a clucking noise with her mouth, a sweet little kissy noise. Mom sighed. Capitulation. Slowly, my mother made her way to the woman's hand, sniffing it with wariness, wanting to be trust. Once mom was out of the cage, a collar around her neck and a man's strong hand hanging onto her leash, the woman gently handed out the six pups into a big box. I yarked a question to the room. What's going to happen? No one answered because no one knew. Mom cast a look in my direction, her tail swinging gently to and fro in a clear message. Whatever it is has got to be better than this minute. Dogs are existentialists. We think of now. But we do have a capacity for learning, which is predicated on our understanding of the past, not as some block of time, but as an action, a pain, a smell. Our idea of the future is limited to hunger pains, I will eat, and anticipation of a walk at a certain time every day. Those of us removed from that cellar that day lacked the imagination to picture a happy place. We knew only that things were going to be different. Eventually, they came to me. Mom and Dad and the kitties were all boxed or muzzled. The growling dog had been silenced with a little happy juice, and the other dog was acting all goofy and happy to see you. I took a hint from him. I didn't want one of those muzzles on me. I suffer a bit from claustrophobia. Ha, ha, ha. I said, cranking the length of my tail into raptures. We gladiator types look amazingly happy when we loll our tongues and split our jaws into grins. The men and the woman bought my act. They slipped a loop around my neck, and we all headed up the narrow stairs to the first floor. I'd never been up there. It reeked of boys' sweat and a pungent smoke. Pizza boxes lay on the floor, tantalizingly out of reach from my nose, as I was constrained by the rigid pole one of the men had in his grip, beer cans were neatly stacked in a pyramid beneath the cracked window in the otherwise empty room. I didn't get to look around for very long, as we were quickly hustled out of the place and into the street. A white van with its back doors wide open idled at the sidewalk. One by one, my parents and the other two dogs were hoisted into cages in the back. We were used to cages and didn't protest. Before I was lifted in, another man, one I hadn't seen before, came out bearing the weight of my last competitor, wrapped in a slippery blue tarp. The man's face was grim, as if he was mourning the loss of a friend he'd only just been introduced to, or that he was sad to be right. There was a moment's inattention as the body of the dead dog wrapped in its slippery shroud slipped out of the man's grasp, thumping to the ground and leaving the empty blue plastic sheet in his arms. The people gasped in unison, and I noticed a lessening of the grip on the pole, a subtle inattention brought on by the clumsy dropping of the dead dog. I bolted.